It's called Heroes and Families Day. We'll talk about it tonight, but we got a lot on our plate. Let's go. Welcome to my state of mind. I am Dan York. It is an honor and pleasure to have you aboard. Yeah, there's a nice event happening at the uh, Smithfield Gazebo uh, this weekend. Uh, you know, it's you know, we, we do these veteran celebrations and honor them on specific calendar days, like, you know, D-Day and Veterans Day and Memorial Day. But it's nice one that we have an off-calendar uh, discussion and celebration. So we have two cool guests to talk about that this evening. But in the meantime, we have a whole lot going on. You know what we didn't do tonight? Because I, 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 cause we had so much packed in to the show, we didn't uh, grab the tape of Bush 41 jumping from a helicopter today. Did, did, have you seen that? Make sure you get to see that. I'm watching that, uh, working out tonight, going, well, this morning. It was like 11 o'clock. I'm, I'm on the stair climber at the local health club, and I'm going, this, this is nuts. The guy is 90. He's 90, but he wants to do it. What if, what if something had happened? Who would want to be responsible? The, the, the file must have been this thick of people who were saying, you know what, I don't want the liability on this. Wave this, wave this, wave that. He jumped at 80, he jumped at 85, and he was harnessed to another guy uh, at 90 this morning. And, I, and he must have eaten some grass, too, because he was in front when they knocked him down. Boom. Uh, and he's having trouble. Walk. God bless him. You know what? That generation of World War II types has more grit than all of us combined ever will. They got guts. Anyway, that's my pre-rundown commentary. I'm glad I got that off my chest. Laura's going, uh, um, anytime you're ready to get started with the show, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, the, this is a problem. This is an upset. And now some local Republicans are trying to use it as a play. Interesting stuff. Uh, speaking of local Republicans playing, they're playing hardball right now inside that primary politics thing. We got a big a budget hit situation here tonight, $8.7 billion worth of decisions that are happening probably as we speak. And uh, amongst the things that the legislature is talking about is adding on a dollar an hour to the expenses of small, of small business. And uh, I didn't know how to spell that. I didn't know. All right, let's go. Yikes, 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 yikes. Almost out of nowhere now, we've got this going on, Washington Post headline kind of speaks for itself, and so does this new story. A group of Iraqis cheered in Baghdad and vowed to fight Islamic militants who are moving closer to the capital. This new army recruit says, I'm here to help Iraqi troops defeat the terrorists. Islamic fighters have already captured two key cities, including Saddam Hussein's former hometown of Tikrit. Many Iraqi troops ditch their uniforms and abandon their posts. The Sunni fighters are vowing to seize Baghdad and topple the government of Shiite Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki. I think it's fair to say that in our consultations with the Iraqis, there will be some short-term, immediate things that need to be done militarily. On Capitol Hill, senators are getting a closed-door briefing on the security situation. Hourly, they are experiencing greater gains while the Iraqi military and police seem to be dissolving before our very eyes. Iraq's prime minister asked parliament to declare a state of emergency so he'd have more power to fight the insurgents, but not enough lawmakers showed up at today's session to vote. Can you imagine that? Not enough lawmakers showed up. Listen, it seems like El Maliki's got to be more inclusive. Uh, you know, I'm no dove when it comes to these kinds of resolves, but it seems that the Sunnis are so fed up with having nothing to do at all with this government operation that if they don't bring some Sunni uh, inclusion into this, these particular militants are just going to, you know, continue to catch fire. I mean, the 70 miles from Baghdad, hello? Now, we're not doing anything about this. We're out. We're out. And then when it gets so, so bad, we're back in. Next item. Uh, yeah, this is huge, right? The politics of America can never be predicted completely. Eric Cantor steps down as majority leader. This package is a little bit about the politics of the House, and then I'll bring it back home. Effective July 31st, I will be stepping down as majority leader. Cantor announced he will give up his plum role, setting the party's legislative agenda five months before he officially leaves office. We will continue uh, to work, and hopefully the Senate will reciprocate uh, so that we can get the work of the American people done. Cantor's loss Tuesday stunned House Republicans, who assumed he would be the next House Speaker. Who do you think should be the next majority? Oh, I have no idea. 
The race to replace him is well underway. The top contender is already on the leadership team, House Majority Whip Kevin McCarthy from California, who has Cantor's vote. I will be backing him with my full support. Veteran Congressman Pete Sessions of Texas has also thrown his hat into the ring. He says border security should be at the top of the agenda. I think this administration needs to be prodded and reminded that our entire sovereignty of the, United, of the United States is at risk if we do not secure our border, north, south, east, and west. Other Republicans considered a run but saw what Cantor went through and decided against it. Democrats said you were too extreme. Conservatives said you were too compromising. What advice do you have for your successor? Maybe we had it right somewhere in the middle. I think that this town should be about trying to strike common ground. Well, you know, Eric Cantor is, was between a rock and a hard place with a hard-running Tea Party candidate who beat him by 11 percent in his district. Everyone went, what happened? Now, there are Republicans all across the country and here at home who are trying to learn a lesson from this or threaten others with it. And of course, the Republican gubernatorial race is hot between Cranston Mayor Alan Fung on the right and Ken Block, former moderate party chairman and creator who's jumped into the Republican Party, right? So there's an email circulating from the Fung campaign last night that Eric Cantor's loss ought to be kind of a reminder to Ken Block and an omen that uh, he's going down too. And I think it's about Ken Block having a, kind of a, you know, not so uh, conservative thought on immigration policy, which of course has very little to do with running this state, at least on a financial level. But it's all this juxtapositioning going on. So it seems like, you know, Block's not a big enough Republican for Alan Fung, and I understand why he's making that case. Alan Fung has talked very little about his own campaign these days and a whole lot about Ken Block, which transitions us to the next item, that Fung is really pressing Ken Block very, very hard on this Obamacare thing. And in this latest ad that they've put out, Fung thinks he's got Block. You, you didn't support Obamacare? No, I've never supported Obamacare. In 2012, I bought what uh, Barack Obama was selling in terms of uh, changes to health care, and I believed that uh, Obamacare, the Affordable, Affordable Care Act, was going to provide the kind of relief that we needed. I think you know the answer to that. I voted for Barack Obama. What, what sold you on voting for Barack Obama? I bought the vision that he would bring forward a workable health care solution. You know, there, there, might be some, there might be some splitting hairs here. I think I jumped the gun there. At the end of it says, you know, Ken Block supports Obamacare. He can't tell the truth, whatever. You know, Block has been fiddling and diddling with his answers on Obamacare only, only to the point where he said, yeah, I voted for Obama twice. I thought it might be a good plan. I realized it wasn't. I don't know how long Ellen Fung is going to be harping on Obamacare. He thinks he's got a winner here. Uh, somewhere along the line, memo to Ellen Fung, you better tell people what you stand for and what you think and what you're going to do. Because if this is all about Obamacare, 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 and Ken Block, there's a tone deafness that occurs. Unsolicited advice, just saying. All right, tonight, 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 they're looking at $8.7 billion tonight, our money. And uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be a comp session or whether it's going to be all heck breaking loose. The headline is here, of course, and this is from WPRI.com. In case you were wondering, yes, our budget proposal has grabbed, uh, has added a million, a billion for the B a billion dollars in just two fiscal years. So when they say, uh, can't find anything in the budget for this and that, just think about that, a billion dollars in two years. House Speaker Nick Mattiello is the guy that's running this whole show tonight, and you know he's gonna try to navigate the cause. The Scott River Bridge tolls are out. Uh, that's a good thing. The estate tax uh, threshold is increased. That's a good thing. But that $12 million a year for 38 studios, while it's small compared to the big budget, is a big thing. And there'll be a brawl tonight, no doubt. We'll talk more about it uh, at our first chance that we can. In the meantime, on the Senate side, guess what? Small business, start to look at your budgets, because if the House, not tonight most likely, but if the House sometime in the next few days takes up what the Senate just did, it's going to get a lot more expensive to run your small business. There's the headline, and here's the report. A bill to bump the state minimum wage from 8 to $9 an hour has cleared the Rhode Island Senate, 
by a vote of 31 to 5. Obviously, the hope is to be able to get it to a point where we do have a living wage. Obviously, $9 an hour, $8 an hour is not a living wage, and every little bit helps. The Senator Lynch says working families are being pushed to the breaking point, parents taking on multiple jobs to make ends meet and provide for their kids. This isn't somebody who's making $50,000 a year and we're bumping it up another $10,000 a year. Adding, you know, a dollar an hour, that money's going to go toward a pizza, that money's going to go toward ice cream, toward a baseball glove. It's going to go toward something that is being purchased locally. Senator Lou Raptakis owns a Coventry pizza shop. He says $9 is an arbitrary figure and too high at that. The minimum wage Raptakis believes should be set to the consumer price index and tick upwards every year. Politicians should stay out of the debate of minimum wage. If we left that alone back in 2008, today's minimum wage, without no debate, would have been $8.53 an hour, $8.53, which is real figures, not fantasy. And on nearby states, upping their base wages to over $10. Massachusetts, Connecticut have a lower unemployment rate by two percentage points. Rhode Island, when you look around in the landscape, you see businesses closing, especially the small businesses. We're talking about the mom and pops. Yeah, and a dollar increase sharply in January would be a tough hit to small businesses. Uh, the senator, Senator Lynch, what, what's she, what's she going to coin this? The pizza and ice cream bill? Uh, we'll have a show on this next week. We have to. We need a debate on this here. And uh, finally, I didn't know how to spell this. Bump, 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 bump. Just, I just feel, I feel something stirring. I've been fretting over the Rangers since this series began, but uh, last night, and they can steal one there, then a momentum shifts, you come back to the garden. There's all sorts of incremental logic you use when you're fantasizing about your team coming back from a three-nothing deficit, but who knows? Jess was gonna wear her Kings shirt today because she's an antagonist. She'll have to keep it in the closet. When we come back, a good cause and a nice celebration. Stay with us. So this is a cool event that's happening this weekend. Let's put some information up here. We'll give it to you at the end of the show, too. A Hero and Families Day, uh, Sunday, June 15th, uh, five hours there at the, uh, the crossings at the Smithfield Gazebo. Join us to honor our veterans by meeting various war reenactors. Now, that's pretty cool. We've got some guests to tell you about it. Mr. Fonseca, it's good to see you. It is very nice to see you. It is a, uh, the, Tony and I have known each other for quite some time. He said, hey, Dan, by the way, we've got this really cool event coming up uh, on that particular weekend. Can you help us out? Of course. And Mike, you're a, a war reenactor, are you uh, not? Well, yeah. I participate in a lot of different events throughout Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Uh, we attend all the, all the different parades and uh, events for veterans and Whoever else wants us to show up, we do the best we can for them. Yeah? Right, great. So we'll talk more about what you do and what it's all about. So what's the concept? This is the first one? It is. Uh, this is something that's being put on by uh, Smithfield Post, uh, Veterans of Foreign War, Smithfield Post 2929. And we decided that we needed something, a venue, to honor our, our war heroes, uh, people, uh, men and women that are out there doing uh, good things to protect this country and, and to help others as well. And uh, these people do uh, something that uh, is very difficult to do, and that's to come back from the war zone and go back, sometimes as many as three or four times. And I tip my hat to these people. These mm -hmm. people are just incredible. And what we did is we wanted to put this format together, this event at the Smithfield Crossings in Smithfield, to hopefully have these uh, fathers bring their young children to the event so they can see different vehicles, whether it's Jeeps or A-Tracks or uh, 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 World War II uh, Jeep that uh, Michael Moses has. And we also have some uh, uh, different artifacts. We also have uh, Civil War reenactments. You know, the, the, it, you know what's kind of interesting to me whenever we have war reenactments or the kind of, most people will consider vehicles of war uh, weaponry machinery to be kind of cool. It's kind of cool. I mean, kids love them in parades. Uh, at the same time, uh, they're, you know, they're vehicles and tools of, of 
destruction. And so it's, a, it's an interesting juxtaposition on the psychology of how we celebrate war, how we celebrate those who have fought wars on our behalf, and we don't celebrate war at the same time. As a war reenactor, do you think about that, Mike? Well, I lived in England during the war. I was a, I was a boy at four years old during the invasion. Uh, I lived in Portsmouth next to the naval yard. Uh, we were bombed constantly. So those vehicles, to me, if it wasn't for them vehicles, I'm going to be here. Mm. You know, so I do what I got to do. You, you do know? what you got to do, meaning what? Well, it's very interesting vehicle. It's like a magnet. I mean, uh, everywhere I go, it's like, uh, wow, where did that thing come from, you know? Well, but specifically, you're talking about what vehicle? Mine. The, Yours. I own a 1942. Uh, Willis that uh, came out of Antwerp, Belgium. It was uh, abandoned there in 1945. Sat there for 50 years in a warehouse. Tom Hanks and Spielberg found out that there was a bunch of vehicles there and he wanted to use them for the movie The Band of Brothers. It was used in the movie Band of Brothers. Turned back over to the uh, Belgium NATO forces. And in turn, 19, in 2006, they auctioned them off. And Mike was one of the lucky guys to get a hold of them. Right. And it's back in Rhode Island. Man, you, 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 you're very proud of the idea that you oh, got yeah. that baby. You got a, doesn't you have a look kind of like, <laughs> like, I got one of these suckers. It's I got it. It's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's That's the one. World War II vintage, <laughs> yeah. 1942. Yeah, but it is, it, it is uh, kind of an interesting conversation about how we really, really um, uh, have such a big interest in, in military assets. Um, but yet we don't celebrate war. It's, uh, you know what I'm talking about? It's I, just, do, it's, I do, It's It's uh, a yeah. funky conversation. I'm certainly not suggesting that you shouldn't come and, and drool over Mike's vehicle because <laughs> I mean, he, he's got a look on his face which says, I got it and you don't. By That's the way. right, but brother. You can, come. can they sit on it? Uh, no. I'm the only guy that lets, lets anybody sit in that vehicle. I let all the kids sit in it. Okay. okay. Go ahead. All right. So, by the way, by the way um, Flag Day is this weekend as well. Uh, we'll talk about when and how it's appropriate to actually celebrate and or commemorate our veterans work you know the calendars are funky things they were okay welcome back we're <laughs> we're talking about heroes and families day june 15th which is this sunday i cannot believe we're already june 15th and there's uh laura taking a late shot because mike was hoarding this picture just like he's proud of his vehicle he was mm. hoarding this picture and finally gave it to us right here during showtime so not a very fancy production, but that's your baby right that's there. It. That's, that's it. That's it. All right, very good. Uh, Mr. Fonseca, talk to me about the calendar and how we celebrate veterans. I just think that, unfortunately, in America today, we are too calendar-oriented when it comes to thanking a veteran. I mean, when I meet that's one, I, I thank them for the service, right? Um, but, the, but if not for the calendar, heck, I don't know what we would do. I mean, D-Day last week was very moving. I had a radio show for three hours where people were talking about, you know, the there's just the the... the the guts of that generation and, and, and just thinking about that invasion and 18, 19 year old kids who were just you know, hitting that beach knowing that one out of four of them was going to be killed, or at least it was proffered that that was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, that generation is the greatest for a reason. So we celebrated that last week, right? Your thoughts about uh, how and when we do all this kind of thing? Well, just to pick up on your points there about that invasion, uh, a lot of people forget that those military men had to climb a mountainside to get behind the German lines. Mm. And uh, in those days, they didn't have the technology uh, to be able to climb that. So a lot of it was just personal fortitude. And they made it, and they got behind the German lines and made it, made it possible for the people on the beach to finally get off the beach. So uh, my hat's off to them, and just courageous, very courageous people. A, a celebration of, of, of D-Day is a once every 10 year type of thing. We've got Memorial Day, which ends up being more of a picnic. we got Veterans Day, which is a little bit more of a three day weekend because the weather's cooler. There's a little bit more paying attention to some of the celebrations that go on. Uh, VJ Day maybe, but for all intents and purposes, right? I mean, thank God we got some other things that you're gonna do. You have a thought on that, Mike, at all, about how we, how we honor our veterans and heroes? Well, I use my Jeep to honor them, that's for sure. Uh, I'll send any event they invite me to to cheer them up, you know, and cheer them on. Yeah. What other reenactments and other stuff you're going to have at the event on Saturday, on Sunday? Uh, we are going to have some. We'll have every uh, group of people there, and they'll be separate, so people will be able to distinguish. We'll have World War II veterans there. We'll have Korean War veterans, and we'll have one spot where the vet, uh, Vietnam veterans are, the Afghan veterans, and the Iraqi veterans, and then we'll have another spot where. Um, the Korean War veterans are. 
okay, with, along with um, um, the reenactors. Like a live history lesson for, for everybody, right? It is, mm -hmm. and everybody uh, is um, asked to come and to ask questions. Uh, as Mike was part of the World War II, I was part of Vietnam. Uh, we have uh, a good contingency of Vietnam veterans there, but we, we should also have some Iraqi people there as well and uh, Afghan. All right. So again, Sunday, right here, we have that information. Let's put it up right sure make sure you guys have, have got that. Sunday, June fifteenth, uh, noon to five. Be a nice day. It's supposed to be great weather. And by the way, it's Father's Day. It'd be a great uh, family day opportunity to get your father out there, especially if he has served the country. Good stuff. Thank Congratulations you. and thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, nice vehicle you got there, buddy. All right, Dan. See you Sunday. Your state of mind will be back there. <laughs> Hey, your state of mind, what you think about stuff we do here. 228-1886, leave me a voicemail, email me, or Facebook post, or tweet at me. Here's an email we got in response to Representative John Brian's visit here, former Rep. John Brian. He ought to be pressing some sort of charges for fraud. I don't see him doing that. It would ruin his political career. He'll run again for office. Don't worry. That was Stephen's response to this guy, John Brian, who was on the show last night, who said, look, I co-signed the loan guarantee program that brought you 38 studios, and I didn't know what was going on. Another day, another dollar in Rhode Island. Well, we'll see you tomorrow night. We'll see you tomorrow on the radio at noon, and tomorrow night at 7.30 on my right to do. Good night.